Hey my friends, what is up? Derek here from Bomb Socks, back with a new week of Bomb Bites, where we feast upon the words of Christ one bite at a time. So I'm excited for this week. We're getting into Matthew chapter 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke chapter 7, and they all kind of have a common theme that we're going to kind of look at that's going to overarch this week. So I want to ask you a question to start off here, and it's going to sound kind of like a weird question, but bear with me. What did Jesus do for a living? Now, there are several different options here. One, he was known as Rabbi Jesus. He was a teacher. I don't know if he got paid to do that, but he was known amongst many of his disciples as Rabbi, right? So he was a teacher. Also, he was known as a carpenter. The book of Mark, it talks about, is not this the carpenter? There's a, there's a cool little thing. This is just kind of a side note to where we're going this week. But I saw this and I thought that this was cool. The chosen translation from the Greek term, so this idea of carpenter, was tekton, which is T-E-C-T-O-N, meaning carpenter. They said it's a bit of a mistranslation. In fact, tekton in Mark, or tekton, which is with a K in Matthew, is more aptly translated into the word describing a contractor, specifically contracting as a builder or a handyman. So not necessarily having anything to do with wood, but in most of these jobs, he likely took to perform necessary maintenance for others. So I have no problems with the idea of Jesus being the handyman, the guy who you went to when stuff needed fixed probably a gospel principle there, right? But there's one that I want to focus on that's a little bit different, and I'm taking some creative license with this, so bear with it. So you go to Mark chapter 2, and you go to about verses 15 to 17. It says, It came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with publicans and sinners, these tax collectors, Matthew being one of those, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in this verse, it talks about Jesus as a physician. Now again, I'm not trying to say Jesus was a doctor, but Jesus could fix anything, including people, right? So if you were to go to your favorite artificial intelligence on your phone and ask for definitions of certain words, if you were to ask what the word physician means, physician is a person qualified to practice medicine, meaning like our family physician. It also says a person who cures moral or spiritual ills or a healer. Okay, this says physicians of the soul. So all through this week, you get to see Jesus in various stages of healing people. For example, I'm going to throw a little list up here. As you can see, some of the things that we've got going on this week. You've got Jesus healing a leper in Matthew chapter 8. You have a centurion servant who is healed. You have Peter's mother-in-law. You have individuals possessed with devils. You've got a man sick with palsy. You have a man with a withered hand. And you have the son of the widow of Nain. All of which get an opportunity to participate in the process of healing from the great physician who is Jesus Christ. So there's healing all through these chapters. Now, I came across a quote a few years ago from President Harold B. Lee, where he said, the greatest miracles I see today are not necessarily the healing of sick bodies, but the greatest miracles I see are the healing of sick souls. Those who are sick in soul and spirit and are downhearted and distraught. And so I remember seeing someone suggest a few years ago that every physical malady has a spiritual counterpart. Like not in like real life as you struggle with a particular physical malady, but as you're reading about them in the scriptures, if you were to take it from a spiritual perspective, there's some cool little things you can see here. For example, leprosy. Leprosy is something unclean that keeps you from being clean. Paralysis, there's a couple examples of this in Matthew chapter 8. It is something that is keeping you from moving forward. You're paralyzed. A fever, Peter's mother-in-law had a fever. Something tormenting your mind and body. If you've ever had a fever, you know exactly what I'm talking about there. You see individuals that are possessed with devils. That is something that is in control over you. Withered hand, when something is withered, it's something within you that is slowly wasting away. And then you have got 
death kind of sounds silly here. Death is something that stops you from living. So when you put all of these things together here, Jesus has power over every single one of these things. Now, one of the things that I'm going to recommend doing for your own personal study, and we're going to talk more about this tomorrow, is to go back through these stories specifically. In fact, let me pull them up for you here. Go back through these stories and find some of the things, now that you know kind of what's been healed, go back and find some of the things that are said or done either by Jesus or the individuals in the healing process. And what you can do is you can make some comparisons to the spiritual struggles we need to overcome. For example, if you go back to Matthew chapter 8, just that first example of the leper, verses 1 through 4, it says, When he was come down from the mountain, this is right after the Sermon on the Mount, great multitudes followed him. Now, verse 2, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See, thou tell no man, but go thy way and shew thyself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So I love the fact that here, Jesus doesn't even see this guy as a leper. He sees him as a child of God. I remember seeing someone suggest to avoid leprous labels in our lives, right? Jesus didn't see this guy as a leper. He saw him as a child of God. He saw past these things. And when you can see past those things, I think that's when healing takes place. And I love how this leper comes worshiping Jesus, right? Even when you are struggling with things that are keeping you from being clean in your life, you can still try to show worship to the Savior. And that's when healing starts to take place. So again, you go back over these stories of healing and you see what Jesus required of them or what the individuals did in this healing process. And I think there's some great little things for you and I to understand as we're going through this. In fact, we're going to talk tomorrow about one of them and how that to me is one of the greatest examples of healing in the scriptures and how you and I get a chance to be a part of that. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks as always for sharing these messages. We love that you do that. Please go check out our amazingly comfortable gospel theme socks at bombsocks.com. You guys have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow. Godspeed. Bye-bye.